Chapters 38 and 39 launch us 150 years into the future. And now Isaiah is speaking to a Judah that is in exile in Babylon, and he tells them to come home. The last verses actually of chapter 48 are a command to Isaiah to tell them to come home. And the first verse of chapter 40 is another command to Isaiah, this time to tell them, um, be comforted, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Let's take a look at these opening verses of chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people. So clearly something bad has happened. They need to be comforted for some reason, but it appears as if this something bad is, is in the past, that they're looking at it in their rear view mirror. Look, it says to them that their warfare is ended. Their iniquity is pardoned. They've received double from the Lord's hand. Now, how do you think this message of, of comfort, um, how do you think this message was received by the Jews? Do they have a positive reception? I mean, I would think that they'd respond well, but look what <clears throat> verse 27 says. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? You don't see me. You don't pay attention to me. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, you may, be, you may say that we should be comforted, but that doesn't change the fact that you abandoned us for 70 years in Babylon. <clears throat> and the exile was just divine neglect. And so here in chapter 40, the tail end, the sad response to this call to comfort is going to kick off the great trial of chapters 41 to 47, where Israel is going to lodge a complaint, an accusation against God, and God will respond. Now, Israel's complaint is twofold. She says, one, the exile is just, <laughs> it is proof of divine neglect. You abandoned us. And two, this one's this is a, a weighty accusation. Um, it is also the exile is a picture of divine weakness. The reason we were hauled off to exile is because the Babylonian gods are stronger than Yahweh. And man, do you think that those accusations can just be left out there? No, Yahweh has to respond. Um, <clears throat> but let's first look at just the abundance of trial language um, that we have in these chapters. Let's first look at uh, chapter 41. Just so I can make the case for you that we have a lot of trial language going on here. Set forth your case, says Yahweh. Bring your proofs, he says. Let's go to 43.9. <clears throat> Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right in this confrontation, this trial, this courtroom drama between Yahweh and Israel. Let's go down to verse 26. Let us argue together, Yahweh says. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. I mean, it almost sounds like this could come from the book of Job. One more. Um, 45, 21. Declare and present your case. Let us take counsel together. So we have this courtroom drama between Israel accusing Yahweh and Yahweh responding. And this drama is going to take place in three three cycles, um, three, three waves. And um, of course, each of these cycles has a very intricate pattern to it as well. And let's just take just a moment to look at how Isaiah has carefully structured and crafted um, this trial scene. Jumping over to our um, <coughs> diagram, our charts here, where um, so we have the, the opening in chapter 40 and closing in 48, and then three cycles. And there's a couple panels in cycle one and two, and then a chiasm in cycle three. Um, so the, the trial itself is going to kick off in A, and then you're always going to have a moment to talk about the servant. You'll, we'll talk about him later too. Very important. And then he's going to talk about um, the new exodus. They're being saved from Babylon. <coughs> Second wave. Um, we have a trial with Israel in A, then a trial with the nations in C, and in between the two um, is a salvation oracle, much like what we had um, here in the middle as well uh, in segment B. Um, and then he's going to talk about his uh, kind of 
epic plans for the nations, for Babylon and for Persia. And then finally, um, the chiasm here in the last section uh, <clears throat> talks about the nations in the outer section. Um, and then uh, Yahweh's announcement of Cyrus uh, in, in uh, the, the middle section. And then in the very center, um, another idol polemic. And, and we need to talk about why those are important. But um, let's move from all of that minutia, all of that detail, which I mainly present just so that you have a picture of how, how careful Isaiah is at, at crafting his, his book. Um, let's turn now to Yahweh's response to Israel's accusations of divine neglect and divine weakness. Yahweh says in response, first, the exile, it wasn't because um, <clears throat> I abandoned you. No, it is because of your sin and your covenant violation that you were hauled off to Babylon. That makes sense. That's the classic argument of the prophets. Um, argument number two, Yahweh says that he will raise up Cyrus, king of Persia, who will both destroy Babylon and restore Israel to the land. Now, that second argument it's a bit complicated. Um, <clears throat> how does this respond to Israel's accusation of divine weakness? Well, um, we need to look at another chart to kind of uh, wade into this, this complex argument of Yahweh's here. All right, I think it's the next one. Here we are, the great trial. And we have Israel's accusations and Yahweh's responses. Um, so <clears throat> this response has several parts to it. First, he's going to say fu his fundamental claim is that there is no one like me. You say that, that, that I'm weak and I'm weaker than the Babylonian gods. I'm telling you now, there is nobody like me beside me. There is no savior. Is there a rock bes besides me? I know of no other. I am the Lord. There is no other. There is none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. Um, the Cushites say, surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God besides him. So that point is made very strongly. And then by implication, of course, the idols of Babylon, um, they are not like me. They, they are not um, as powerful as I am. As a matter of fact, they are, they are nothing. Um, he speaks of the craftsmen building the idol, but their work, their idol, it is less than nothing. Their work is nothing. Their metal images are an empty wind. They're hevel, if you remember that word. Um, the person who trusts in these idols, the Babylonians, they will be put to shame. They are um, nothing. They do not profit. They have no knowledge. They cannot move, and they certainly cannot save. Um, you have to carry them. There's no way that they can carry you. Um, and then he says next that um, it is only I who know the end of the beginning from the beginning. I am the God of all of history, calling generations from the beginning. Tell us what is to happen. Tell us the former things. Declare to us <coughs> things to come. Who declared it from the beginning? Um, who among you can declare the former things? And what will happen afterwards? Can your idol do it? Certainly not. And, and God's proof that he's the God of history, that he knows the end from the beginning, and that makes him um, <clears throat> unparalleled by, uh, by all uh, spiritual beings, is his proof is that he called Cyrus, king of Persia, by name 150 years before his birth. Um, to act as Israel's savior and Babylon's destroyer. He called up this one from the east, from the north. His name is Cyrus. He gives him the, the, the title of shepherd, interestingly. And he, um, and interestingly, he stirred him up, this prey from the east. He brought him. He will make him prosper in his way. Only God <clears throat> can do that, um, and therefore he is not weaker than the Babylonian gods. They're idols which are less than nothing. But I want to return to God's first argument um, because it's a little bit more, it's, it's deeper than it may at first appear. Now, um, the opening chapter of this trial, chapter 41, is going to apply an ancient title to Israel. It's going to call Israel my servant, um, a title which was first given to Abraham. 
Um, but as, as a servant, what is Israel to do? What is Israel's role? How are they to serve Yahweh? Well, the answer to that um, is in the following chapter, chapter 42, where we have a description of the role and the mission of Yahweh's servant, Israel. Take a look at this. An important and powerful chapter. Chapter 42. Behold my servant, my chosen one, um, filled with the Spirit. What is his role? What is he to do? He will bring forth justice to the nations. That's what his role is. And he will be a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. He will open blind eyes. Now, tell me, does that sound like the Israel that you know? It doesn't sound like Israel to me. Um, <clears throat> because the same chapter, we scroll down to verse 19. Here we are. They're supposed to open blind eyes, right? Look at verse 19. Here, you deaf, look, you blind one that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? My servant is blind. He is a deaf messenger. Um, Israel is supposed to open blind eyes, but is itself blind. Israel is a bad <laughs> servant, uh, um, an, an illegitimate, a, a disqualified servant who doesn't serve Yahweh well in their mission, their purpose. This reminds them, of course, their blindness harkens all the way back to chapter 6 and uh, Isaiah's call narrative, his commission, where it says that Israel, to whom he will speaking, they will keep on seeing, but they will not perceive. So we got ourselves a problem. Israel is disqualified from being a servant to the nations. What is Yahweh's solution? <coughs> Yahweh will call an individual, one person. He will call an individual servant to act on behalf of and in place of the nation of Israel, um, the servant of God. And with that, welcome to chapters 49 to 55 which are going to give us three more servant songs. We've got our first servant song in chapter 42. Now we have three more, and that's how this next section is structured. And each of these songs are going to further uh, clarify and identify the role and the mission and the purpose of this servant, who we now know is an individual. Well, let's dive into our first servant song in chapter 49. Let's learn about who is this servant who's going to um, act in place of the nation of Israel. What is the servant's mission? Well, <clears throat> um, he was called from the womb to be, I think I'm Mary, to be his servant. And his mission is one, to bring Jacob back to him, to gather Israel back, um, to, to bring them to repentance. But it's too light for him to be a servant simply to Israel. He will be a light to the nations. This, of course, is pointing us right back to chapter 42. But the thing is, this servant, he's discouraged. Look at this in verse 4. I have labored in vain, says the servant. I have spent my strength for nothing and for, for vanity. Is this hevel? Yes, for hevel. Why is the servant um, discouraged? Well, he's discouraged because he is despised by the nation to whom he is sent. Look, he sent to bring back Jacob. And it says in, in verse 7 that the one is deeply despised, abhorred by the nation. He is despised by the nation of Israel to whom he is sent. And this will introduce us to a brand new theme. We haven't, we haven't heard of this theme yet. The servant is going to be rejected by the people to whom he is sent. Um, and this theme is going to be picked up in a big way in our next servant song in chapter 50. Let's take a look at that one. Next servant song, scroll down, it's a long chapter. It begins in 50 verse four, where he says that Yahweh has given me, this first person singular, this is the servant. <clears throat> He's given me a tongue to speak words of wisdom. Think about chapter two, the nations learning the Torah um, from this king on Mount Zion. And he is also, given him an ear, right? An ear to listen, to Shema, to Yahweh. Um, Israel is deaf, but this servant, this servant can hear. 
Um, now, how will deaf and blind Israel respond to this servant? Well, look at verse 6. They will abuse him. I gave my back, gave my back to those who strike, my cheek to those who pull out the beard, and I did not hide my face from, from spitting. He will be spit on and struck, and his beard will be pulled out. And yet, somehow he is confident that Yahweh will help him. Behold, Yahweh, my God, he helps me and he will vindicate me. What could that mean? What, what could it mean that the, <clears throat> the servant will be despised, rejected, struck in the face, and yet helped and vindicated? What, what could this vindication look like? Well, we have to keep on reading. And for that, we will turn to our third servant song in chapters 52 and 53, Isaiah 53. Now we know so far, let's, let's kind of sum it up so far with this servant. God will call an individual servant to act on place of a, the rebellious nation of Israel, but this rebellious nation will itself rebel against that servant. And the significance, the meaning, the purpose behind um, the nation's rejection of the servant will be told for us in chapter 53. Let's, let's take a look. All right. The famous Isaiah 53. He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. Now, what does that remind you of? That must take you all the way back to Isaiah chapter 4, the, the branch, and 6, the um, the shoot from the stump, and then <clears throat> chapter 11, the stump um, of Jesse, there will come new growth. Well, let's, let's keep on reading here. <clears throat> well, this, this uh, shoot from the stump of Jesse will be, again, despised and rejected by men, specifically by his nation. Now, now why? Um, doesn't this mean that his, his mission, he's, his mission is to bring and, and restore and bring back is, Israel and Judah, um, and he's rejected by them? Certainly, his mission has failed, right? No, that's because his mission is accomplished by his suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The Lord laid on him our um, <clears throat> iniquities, the iniquities of us all. You see, Israel, they went astray, um, but God's mission is to bring them back, and he will do that by dying as a guilt offering. This is, this is taken right out of the book of Leviticus. His soul makes a guilt offering, but he will not stay dead. Look at the very next Line. He will prolong his days. After he dies as a guilt offering, he will prolong his days. He will be resurrected. And there's this strange line. He will see his offspring. There's that word again, seed, Zerah. He will see his offspring. What does that mean? Well, each of these three songs <clears throat> has a corresponding response or, or a potential response by the nation of Israel. So in chapter 50, verse 10, it asks this question, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Now that implies there, there will be some in Israel who will fear Yahweh and obey the voice of his servant. And then the very first verse of Isaiah 53 asks another question. It asks, who has believed what he has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's a curious phrase. What does the arm of the Lord mean? But an arm that, that struck um, his own servant. Well, verse 10 of Isaiah uh, chapter 53 is going to call this group, this group who um, to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed, it will call him uh, his seed again. We just saw that. And then, of course, that points us back to the remnant, the seed, the offspring of chapter 6. And then in chapter 54, which gives another uh, potential response, um, it returns the title of servant to Israel, to a faithful Israel who believes um, what we have said about the servant. Now, at this point, in the whole book of Isaiah, 
his main burden is accomplished. How will God fulfill his covenant promise to Abraham and to David to be a light to the nations, um, despite the fact that Israel is rebellious and in exile? He will do that through the atoning death of the servant in their place. All that is left to answer in the book of Isaiah is who is listening to the servant and who is not? And how will these two groups be uh, dealt with? And that is what the final section of Isaiah 56 to 66 is all about.